Hi, welcome to this brief introduction of type. I'm Bob Eichinger, and I'd like to introduce you to my partner, Roger Pierman, who is one of the leading practitioners of type in the world. Roger, I understand you've been working on type for some time. How did that get started? When I was a freshman at Wake Forest University, we were introduced to psychological type in a career planning workshop, and I became so captivated by uh, understanding the, the fact that the way my mind works is uh, very different than a number of other people, and I could understand it in rational ways. Different than mine, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I pursued uh, throughout my undergraduate years in graduate school understanding Carl Jung, who had created the model of the system, and then began using type in my practical clinical work and then researching with type to explore the differences of type in all the ways um, that I could then take the data and make it useful and practical for other people. So type has been your entire life since college. It certainly has been a pretty significant part of the things that I've contributed to. So you mentioned Carl Jung. So type has been around for some time, but I assume it sort of has changed over time. Mm. You know, Carl Jung first, uh, when he wrote Psychological Types, he was giving us um, uh, if I remember right, he begins the book with the statement, I now want to take up the type problem. And by that he meant, I, I want to look at all of the data that I paid attention to, history, literature, philosophy, my own empirical studies. Um, he had stayed with the Navajo in the United States and had seen patterns of, of the way they talked about the medicine wheel and worldview and how your worldview influenced your behavior. And so he put all of those things together, his clinical experience, his more sort of social, archaeological experiences, and said there are these patterns, there are these distinctive patterns that we can get a handle on and understand the way people operate in more constructive ways. Um, he used it primarily in clinical work but, and wrote any number of things following his initial work, but he certainly laid the groundwork for um, what followed which was, of course, we know here in the United States, um, a mother-daughter team uh, became interested in looking at patterns of behavior, and Isabel Myers created the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and then an explosion of interest in type followed. And what time period was Carl Jung doing this? Um, Psychological Types was first published in 1921. Okay. Um, Isabel Meyer started her work on the in the indicator that she produced in the mid 40s during World War II. In a letter she wrote to Mary McCauley, she said it occurred to her in listening to the radio reports of how things were occurring in World War II that the MB, that an indicator would help people understand how to use their talents more effectively in the war effort. And so she then set about creating uh, the MBTI. I've heard over the years of critics of type saying, you know, type isn't real. That is, people, we don't really know from a research standpoint that people act in consistent ways. Is there a response to that? Well, fortunately, in the last 20 years, there has been such a, an abundance of research that has shown us that indeed there are distinctive patterns in the way people behave. And those patterns hold up pretty well across time and situations and produce fairly predictable results. Now it is true we adjust and modify our behavior from time to time, but the core of our natural interests in terms of the kind of things that stimulate us and excite us, the kinds of information we're attracted to, how we go about making decisions, those remain pretty constant and persistent across life. Okay. Now I've also seen in the literature and listen to people say that type is a preference mm -hmm. and of course you can't always do in life what you mm -hmm. want to do uh, so what's the difference between how I actually act express type versus mm -hmm. preferred type or is that the same mm -hmm. or is it different well I think folks would immediately recognize that there are times when I might alter my behavior to be more effective in a given situation, but that doesn't mean my core self has changed. Um, my natural patterns, my natural proclivities, my, my natural impulse responses, um, they're always there. And, and that's the core of what type is. It's sort of, if I often say, in the wiring. It is our natural 
desire to respond to things in a certain way. But we learn and we grow and we adapt and we adjust. And so from time to time we might express some things about ourselves that um, aren't necessarily our preferred way to respond to a situation, but certainly uh, we do it because we know we'll be more effective in that particular conversation. But our core self hasn't changed and that core self uh, sort of holds us steady um, over time uh, and situations and you can pretty much count on it. So left to our own devices, we'll return to core type, but situations and contexts might bring us to a different expression of type. I think that's true. Okay. Let's go through some of the basics. There are the famous four combinations mm. of letters. Mm. Uh, extrovert, introvert, E and I, mm. what, what is that? As we think about extroversion and introversion, the very basic core of what that whole set of differences is about is how one gets renewed psychological energy. Folks with an extroverted preference fundamentally are stimulus hungry. They need to have experiences, tactile, verbal, visual experiences to sort of create a kind of energy so that they have the energy to respond to what's going on around them. Folks with an introverted preference are individuals who tend to get their energy by reflecting on their experiences and pondering different responses and mentally playing with information, um, which seems to produce a, a lot of energy. You know, when you can put um, caps on people's heads to measure how their brain works and you see distinctive patterns, and folks who have an extroverted preference consistently show that they are eager for stimulation and folks with an introverted preference do not show that they need external stimulation for the same level of brain activity, um, that's a pronounced and significant difference. So E's get their energy and pay attention to the world out here and I's get motivated mm -hmm. by what's inside, okay? S and N, sensing and intuition. You know, every form of study of, of human differences that I know of essentially has to deal with um, how do we perceive the world in some way, and how do we act on those perceptions? And in the model of type, perception is about are you attracted to tactile, concrete, hands-on, sensory experience, which is what the sensing is about, meaning you're pulled toward the pragmatic, concrete details of everyday life, or are you more likely to find that you are more interested in how the dots pull together as a pattern? Are you more interested in making associations about the pieces of information that are in front of you? And in fact, um, your mind, those folks with an intuitive preference, their mind is inclined to naturally look for what's the pattern in a situation? What's the, the way this fits into a larger future possibility? So it's a different approach to life experiences where in one case you're seeking to anchor and concretize that experience in another case, you're seeking to imagine how those information points work together to create a bigger picture. Now, the third set of letters are thinking and feeling. And as I mentioned, perceiving and some sort of deciding about our perceptions. And in, and in type, the, the two patterns around judgment are around, do you prefer, and at the end of the day, are you likely to line up your options and look at pros and cons, evaluate those pros and cons, putting weights on criteria and doing any number of things to come out with a, what you perceive to be a logical conclusion, which has some sense of, of, of um, objective verification. Folks with a preference for feeling, and that word, let's just admit, has a number of connotations to it. Some people think of it as emotion, yep. some people think of it as tactile feeling. In this model, it's about do you prefer um, to make decisions based on a set of ideals. Uh, uh, and in those ideals, it more often than not uh, involves um, how you think people need to be working together. How can people work toward achieving their objectives? Whether or not um, there's any sort of logical analysis at first is, is less important than whether or not are we moving toward achieving what we believe to be the ideal outcome. 
So the, the, the word feeling is probably not the best word for that. It's certainly not from my perspective. You know, if we had ideal or values or some other Well, term. we couldn't use IV. That, that would work. <laughs> <but okay. laughs> the last set of letters are P and J. Myers introduced this to the, the, the type. Oh, this was picture. not original to Young. This was not Young. Okay. Uh, what she observed was um, that people tended to orient themselves to the world either by uh, structure, order, closure, wanting to have things done in a systematic, methodical way, or they tended to be ad hoc, emergent, go with the flow, see what occurs, um, and get sort of excited by that. Now she knew that those two qualities were tied to the sensing, intuiting, thinking, and feeling piece. And so she, she was trying to use this fourth dimension to give a thread of insight about how the person was using um, those other processes. But it was not Jung's, it was her introduction into the ways in which we now understand type. Is it generally accepted now, the fourth set of letters among practitioners, or are there pure Jungians who just yeah. do the three? Well, there's certainly uh, some who are just quite Jungian in their look at those key dimensions. But overall, if you looked at the millions of people who've been exposed to type and who've come to accept and verify the J and the P dimension, I think it's fair to say it's accepted. Okay. Now, from what you've said, then, uh, not all I's are alike. It depends upon what the other letters are. Mm -hmm. So you can't, or you shouldn't, just pay attention to the letters. In fact, um, you should see the letters as merely an invitation to look at a system, a psychological system. So, indeed, all introverts are not the same. All extroverts are not the same. We know that when we start looking at the whole pattern, and let's take for an example a person who prefers I, S, T, and J, what we know about that pattern is that a person with I, S, T, and J preferences, their inner world is rich with data. Their outer world is one where they tend to focus on analytical energies and critiquing. And so, when you look at the four letters, it's not immediately apparent to you why that would be true. You'd have to understand type dynamics to understand what uh, I just suggested. But what I just suggested is about the whole. And it is the whole where we get to understand the richness of differences, um, where we can actually begin to build applications, where we begin to realize that whole pattern has a typical predictable response to circumstances uh, and here are some things we can do to utilize those talents in the most productive way or respond to those folks in the most productive way. So if I have two eyes and I'm working with, they might, in fact, act quite differently. Indeed, very. In all likelihood, if they are a different type, uh, we could see some significant differences in now the way they, they approach. They both live inside their head. Yes. But what's in the head is different. Yes. And the sequence in which they do things is different. That's correct. Okay. How would I find out about my type? What's the best way to get assessed? Well, I think there are multiple avenues that can lead to deeper insights around type. Um, obviously, some of the key publications that you can access and read about the different type patterns um, can give you a huge insight around the needs of the 16 patterns. Um, there are assessment tools that are available now. There are so many tools that are approaching psychological type in different ways that you sort of need to step back and think, what, what's the kind of application I have if I want to take a tool um, and uh, how will I use that application in order to, is it more personal, more professional, etc., uh, in order to make sense of of the information that's in the report that's generated. Um, because by now, with, with so many millions of people having taken a number of tools, there is so much data about the patterns and the specificity of the patterns in different contexts um, that you really need to think about which assessment method is going to be most useful. But as I said, there are books, resources, there are any number of assessment tools. 
Um, and as always, there's a little caveat. Um, not all tools, not all books are created equal in terms of the clarity of their research and the support that they have underneath the assessment. So a little bit of homework has to be done to make sure that you're dealing with something that's based on reasonable um, analysis of information and not just someone's uh, Saturday afternoon quiz that they've created. This sort of connects in with something I've heard people say over time, that is, I've taken it several times and I always test differently. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think mm -hmm. that means? Yeah. Well, that, that proposes a number of possible issues. Um, one is that um, the individual actually took two different instruments. They might have taken one instrument at one point in their career and later on another one, and it produced some different results in part because the instruments were constructed very, very differently and the way they responded and know themselves is very different. So there's that sort of artifact that could result in a difference. But, but in general, I think we have to remember any assessment tool is at best an estimation. And it's an estimation based on how you think of yourself at this particular point in time. Given those questions. Given those questions. And so um, it may well be that in college you answered uh, an instrument and you came out, let's say, ENTJ. And then 25 years later in a leadership development seminar you came out INTJ. And the person might say, well, gee, that's a huge difference. Well, as we begin to talk with the individual and we begin to explore what their life experience has been like, usually it gets to be pretty clear. Um, in fact, has the type been INTJ all along? It's just that in college, uh, to be more socially connected yep. and engaged, they saw themselves as more extroverted. So the than testing they are. condition and the particular instrument can make a big difference. That's right. Then the second comment I always hear is, "I used to be X, mm -hmm. but now I'm Y." Mm -hmm. Is is that real or possible, or what is that? Well, I think what is is real is that your understanding of yourself could be different at different points in time. The basic impulses of the type, however, I suspect have always been there. And it, with some retrospective review of your life and reflection on choices and patterns and some additional data that you could collect, you probably could get information that would clarify um, how your type has evolved over time. End of the day, though, is it's how your pattern is working for you right now. What are ways in which that pattern seems to be persistent? Uh, what are some of the you know, contributions you get to make as a result of that pattern? What are some potential areas you need to stretch as a result of that pattern to enable you to be more effective and fulfilled in the work that you're doing? So I could purposefully develop into a different express type if I did that in an orderly, insightful way? I would say that you could develop a, a range of behaviors that might look like other type patterns, but the core pattern of who you are, I think, uh, hardly really changes. And then I would assume, just from a brain resources standpoint, that it would take up more resources to be outside of my true core type. And there is some evidence that that is true, that the amount of energy it takes to consistently behave outside of your natural pattern is huge. So if I'm an I, but I'm in an E job for some reason, mm -hmm. I, I could do that, mm -hmm. but it would take a toll. You would definitely need to make sure you created a space for renewal. Opportunities, many vacations during the day, so that you could pause and reflect, get into a space where you had a chance to renew yourself in order to have the energy to go forward in that more extroverted role. Likewise, those with an extroverted preference, for example, and depending on the other letters, the needs, the particular needs would vary. But if you're in a role that kept you away from people from long periods of time, there's a chance you would need to create uh, more opportunities to network uh, throughout the day in order to get the kind of stimulation you're looking for. Thank you, Roger, for that uh, quick review of type. We're excited to welcome you to this new application. All of Roger's wisdom is in the application, and we think that in using the application, you can be a better and more effective person and a manager. So thanks for coming and good luck.
Thank you.